Hello, Brian Weeks here again with another MMCD contract consideration. This video clip will cover the topic of dispute resolution under MMCD rules. In this video, I'm going to explain the need for a process, the reasons for the involved process that we use, the steps in that process, the time deadlines involved, and who participates at each stage. In 1992, when the original mandate was given to create a balanced contract, one of the prime requirements was to create a fair dispute resolution process. Those of us involved in the creation of this language all had far too many painful memories of creating, challenging, and defending claims and counterclaims in court. There had to be a better way, and we believe we've created one. A significant measure of our success with the MMCD is that in over several thousand contracts since the first publication in 1995, there has not been a single dispute between a contractor and an owner that had to be resolved in court in British Columbia. This is in significant contrast to the years before the MMCD when at least some contractors and municipalities were in court every year. Why is a dispute process needed? Well, that ties back to why have a contract at all? A contract is only needed when there is some kind of misunderstanding between the owner and the contractor. Because no contract can anticipate every eventuality, possibility, and needed change, there will always be omissions and misunderstandings. But even with the best of intentions, everyone makes mistakes. Sometimes disputes are legitimate, but sometimes they're created for strategic reasons, such as attempting to create a delay, apply leverage to settle something else, prove a point, in other words, ego involvement, or obtain more money or other consideration. The reality is, no matter the cause of the dispute, it must be settled before the project can be considered complete and the files closed. When designing the MMCD dispute resolution process, we work from three basic premises. Number one, the sooner a dispute is addressed and resolved, the less damage it does to schedules, costs, and working relationships. Every dispute I've been involved in got more expensive as it took longer to resolve. Sometimes, this was just simply that the accountants were able to capture more costs, and sometimes it was just that positions hardened and negotiations became less successful. Similarly, the longer a dispute drags on, the more ego involvement comes into play and working relationships deteriorate, again, causing costs to escalate and schedules to slip. Two, no party should be able to stall the dispute process for any reason, let alone for strategic advantage. This includes the contract administrator. Number three, Finally, if the matter cannot be resolved quickly by personnel working together in the field, the dispute needs to be escalated. Having more senior people involved brings different perspectives and reduces the chances of damaging working relationships. To effectively implement these premises, we designed a multi-step process which maximizes the chances that the two parties will come to a resolution before having to get a judge or an arbitrator to impose one. If you have a copy of our volume two, look at the last pink page to find this logic flowchart for dispute resolution. To make it simpler to follow, I've boxed the various steps that I will discuss individually. The chart shows where the time deadlines occur and gives the general condition clause number which relates to each step. You will see that each step has the potential for resolution. All the steps but the last result in consensual resolution between the two parties. If you don't have a copy of Volume 2, you can pause this video and zoom the screen to see the overall flow. Here are the steps involved. Number one, get the initial decision from the contract administrator. Nothing happens without this. Number two, if one party does not like the initial decision, a formal dispute notice must be filed within 10 working days. 
Once this happens, the superintendent, foreman, contract administrator, and inspectors no longer need to deal with the matter amongst themselves. Step three. The next step is to have a negotiating meeting where the next level of staff from both sides meet to decide if the dispute can be resolved quickly. Step four. Failing that, an independent referee must be brought in to give an opinion unless both parties agree to waive the step or a referee cannot be found in time. Step five. Failure to accept the referee's opinion leads to the requirement for a settlement meeting involving the most senior staff from both sides and we also recommend involving a mediator to assist. Step six, if all else fails, the matter will be decided by a judge or an arbitrator. Let's look at the steps in detail. Here's the first step. Naturally enough, before you can get into the dispute process, a dispute must be created and defined. We require any point of contention to be put to the contract administrator for a defined initial decision pursuant to GC 3.6.2. The CA has a reasonable time to answer, but if this is exceeded or if one party intends to dispute the initial decision, the CA is obliged to put it in writing within three days of the formal request to do so. To prevent the CA from stalling the process, if the CA does not comply within time, then the party pursuing the dispute can proceed to the dispute notice without the written decision after the three days has passed. Then within 10 working days of receiving the initial decision, a party intending to pursue the dispute must file a formal dispute notice in writing. The 10 days is a hard limit. Missing this deadline means the CA's initial decision becomes binding and is not appealable through the rest of the process. Let me repeat that. Failure to file the dispute notice within the 10-day requirement crystallizes the initial decision and no appeal is subsequently possible by either party. GC 17.3.3 and 17.3.4 define the requirements for the contents of the dispute notice and emphasize it must be a separate written notice, not just some mention in another document. Assuming the dispute notice was filed in time, a five-day clock starts for the next step, negotiation. Within this time, GC 17.4.2 requires the two parties to meet to discuss if the dispute is really worth fighting over or if some negotiated settlement can be quickly reached. For the reasons I discussed earlier, we encourage the two parties to provide different people, non-field staff if possible, to do the negotiating, such as the contractor's estimator and the owner's project manager. This step is the earliest, simplest, and least costly method of resolving the dispute. If the negotiators will not meet or fail to reach a settlement, then the next step is to appoint a referee. This step can only be bypassed with the written consent of both parties. A referee is any person the two parties agree can provide a new, impartial, and useful opinion. Most times, the two parties exchange names and pick a person acceptable to both sides. If this fails, they can apply to the MMCD Association and we'll see if one of our certified referees is available. If we cannot provide one, then the referee step can be bypassed so as not to, dis to delay the dispute resolution process. The referee has several tasks, all of which must be completed within 10 days of appointment. Number one, investigate the facts of the dispute, including interviewing any personnel and reviewing all documents available to both parties. Number two, provide copies of all documents held by each party to the other party. Number three, provide a written opinion of how the referee thinks a judge or an arbitrator might rule if the parties cannot agree. Ten days after the referee issues his opinion, he will contact the parties to see if it will form the basis of a settlement. He will then advise both parties of the other's position. 
This ends the referee's involvement in this dispute. But should other disputes arise, the parties are encouraged to use the same referee again. See my other contract consideration video, What's a Referee, for more details on this step. If both the negotiating meeting and the referee's involvement have failed to bring a settlement, the parties have one last chance for consensual resolution. Step five, a demand for a settlement meeting, must occur within 10 days of the receipt of the referee's opinion. We encourage the two parties to bring their most senior decision makers to this meeting as it is the last chance to avoid a third party imposed solution with its inherent delays and costs. We suggest the owner of the contractor's firm and the chief administrative officer for the municipality would be appropriate. We also suggest that this is the point where the two parties should consider involving a mediator. The mediator has no binding authority. He or she is merely there to assist the two parties to reach a consensual resolution. But if the settlement meeting has not occurred within 30 days of the demand, or a resolution has not been reached within seven days of the start of the meeting, then consensual resolution is not possible and the final step must be taken. Of course, any time limit in this process can be extended, but only by mutual agreement. This ensures neither party can unilaterally stall the process. Any delay must be by agreement or default on both sides. Having failed to resolve the dispute consensually, the two parties will only get one more choice. Will the decision be imposed by an arbitrator or a judge? Failure to agree on the use of an arbitrator will default the process to court. In my opinion, if the two parties let the dispute get to this point, they have both lost, and only the lawyers will win. Even after a final decision, neither party will be able to truly determine the actual cost of the dispute. It is comparatively easy to do the accounting for the personnel time involved, their expenses, and the fees paid to lawyers, experts, consultants, stenographers, and the like. However, it is never possible to truly calculate the lost opportunity cost of what might have been done or accomplished with the time all of the staff on both sides will use up in a multi-year process. The smaller the organization, the higher this lost opportunity cost will be. So let's summarize. Number one, the MMCD process is designed to A, maximize the chances for the two parties to resolve the dispute without having to get an arbitrator or judge's decision. B, prevent any party from delaying resolution hopefully to solve the dispute more quickly before more damage is done to relationships, costs, and schedules. C. Remove the resolution process from the field staff level to assist them to work together amicably. And D. Protect the contract administrator while providing an appeal process. Two. No dispute can be started without A the initial decision from the contract administrator, unless after a formal request the CA refuses to issue it, and B, the formal dispute notice issued within 10 days of the initial decision. Otherwise, the initial decision becomes binding on both parties and unappealable. Three, referee involvement is mandatory unless both parties agree in writing to waive it, or B, after a request, the MMCD Association cannot provide one. At each succeeding stage, more senior representatives from each side should be involved. Five, neither the referee's nor the mediator's opinion is binding. They are present only to assist. Both parties split the referee and the mediator costs. Six, if you let it dispute fester until a judge or an arbitrator has to make a binding decision, only the lawyers will win in the end. You will never be able to calculate the true costs of the dispute. I hope that's helped clarify this contract consideration. Please check our website for further assistance and to see what other topics are presented in this series.